Hello, hello, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to the first module of our webinar series on facilitating large scale change. Uh, I'm Ian Smith, I'm Program Lead for Improvement Methodology in NHS England's Sustainable Improvement Team. I'll uh, be facilitating this webinar session today, working with other colleagues from the Sustainable Improvement Team, including Claire Potts, who you can see there on screen, and Linda Todd, whom you can't. Uh, they will be looking after all things technical for us, so please do get in touch with Claire or Linda via the chat box if you need any help or support. And we also have with us today uh, Michael Anderson, who will be helping myself keep an eye on the chat box and the questions for our speaker today, who is Debbie Sorkin. Now, Debbie is National Director of Systems Leadership at the Leadership Centre, which specialises in strengthening leadership across public services. Uh, within the Leadership Centre, Debbie leads a national systems leadership programme. Uh, that programme is backed by the NHS as well as local and national government. Uh, Debbie herself has a background in leadership in social care. She's a regular writer and speaker on leadership issues. She's presented at many national events, including uh, for ourselves in NHS England and our colleagues in NHS Improvement. So Debbie will lead for us today's session, which will introduce the fundamentals of systems leadership which is an important dimension of large-scale change. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you across to Debbie to get us underway. So, welcome, Debbie. Thank you very much, Ian. Welcome, everyone. And thank you also for making the time to take part in this webinar this afternoon. It's really good to see so many of you here. I thought we might use this session to think about what it means to lead when you're trying to get large-scale change, not just in your own organization or even department, which is hard enough, but in a system, so where it's complex, where you might not have positional authority and therefore you need to influence. It might be political, large or small p. There will be no end of external commentators on what you're doing, not invariably helpful, and no end of internal constraints, money, people, space, there will be something. You need to balance the short and the long term. And you need to be able to function in what I would call dysfunction, so where everything isn't actually going swimmingly all around you. I wanted to focus particularly this afternoon, therefore, on systems leadership approaches and how they can help you in these circumstances. We'll draw partly on research and thinking, but mainly on practice. Practice from places around the country where people have been trying out these approaches for themselves, with an emphasis on do's and don'ts and actions and behaviours that people have found really work. And this is with a view to your having practical tools and techniques that you can take away and use. At the same time, we'd like this to be a really interactive webinar, so we've got some exercises dur during the event, and we'd really appreciate your feedback and questions and other comments in the chat room. So if it's all right with you, we'll start. Now, most of what I talk about will be in the context of the NHS or social care or local government. But I wanted to actually start here. You see, large-scale change is where you should be having the honest conversation. It's where the real work needs to happen. But more often than not, when I go around the country, it can feel like this. You're supposed to be making things happen, but you don't feel in a position to do so. You feel almost physically squeezed out and constrained and pressured. Other people aren't necessarily listening to you or doing what they're supposed to do, so they'll be saying one thing in a meeting and then going off and not doing what they promised to do. They'll be going off in different directions. They're just standing around being woolly or bleating. I will end this metaphor in a moment. Um, or they're bleating about problems, why something can't be done, or it can only be done with more money, usually your money. And it can feel daunting, even overwhelming. And this is where I think systems leadership can help, because it is designed to help you lead in these kinds of situations. Systems leadership 
is about breaking large-scale change down to size and making it manageable. I sometimes call it the god of small things because it's about how you make progress in small steps, how you make marginal gains that over time accumulated um, and will actually build into something bigger. So think of what you're doing, not in terms of one giant change, but of a series of small changes, progress at the margins. And margins not just in terms of limits, but in terms of boundaries. This is how you lead across boundaries. Boundaries between departments in an organization, between organizations, between sectors, between professions, between geographies. But fundamentally, it's about how you lead when you are not in charge. And when all your great plans and ideas come up against those two things of real life and other people. Other people who have different priorities and perspectives and sometimes even language to you. Language especially when they're using exactly the same words. So this is a really great tool to have in your armory. It's not a silver bullet, but we know from research and evaluation and practice that it can fundamentally change what happens. It changes the way people think and therefore what they do and therefore ultimately what happens on the ground. And as the evidence for systems leadership has built up over time, it's become more and more widely acknowledged and widely used. So it's useful to actually know about. And if we think about why this is, it's because we shouldn't really be surprised. Systems leadership goes with the grain. It goes with the reality of what people are experiencing, which is another way of saying it goes with complexity. I want to think about this for a bit. Complexity isn't the same as saying something's complicated. Open heart surgery is complicated. That is, you need high skill. You need very, very professional people who know what they're doing. You need lots and lots of these people. Um, lots of things can go wrong. There are risks here. But the key thing is, we've done open heart surgery before. We know how to do it. It's not new. There are rules to follow. If you do that, you are likely to have success. In a complex situation, by contrast, you don't know what to do. No one knows what to do because your situation is new. There is no rule book you can take off the shelf. And anybody who claims that there is and that they do know what to do is fibbing. They are fibbing to you and they are fibbing to themselves. And sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is to say to everyone, hey, you know what? This is new. No one knows what to do. Can we all get together and think about what our next couple of steps should be. So a complex situation is one that's new or unfamiliar. Or it's sometimes called recalcitrant. That is, you've got rubbish systems and rubbish processes, but everybody knows them and everybody's used to them, so everybody works with them. Or they've been around forever and nothing you try seems to make any difference. In my day job, I work often with A&E delivery boards. And there are people there have been working for years around the four-hour target, and not for the want of trying, but they cannot actually seem to make a shift. Complex situations will involve lots of different people in different sectors. There will commonly be a political dimension of one kind or another. That can be councils. It can be national politics as well. Uh, no one person is going to be in charge, actually, no matter what it says on their name badge. And there's no linear relationship. So you can have a large um, scale change or initiative that you think is going to make a big difference. It doesn't do very much in practice. You can have something quite small, and it has an impact out of all proportion to what you originally expected. Sometimes you don't know quite what the issue is. You don't know where it begins or ends, or it's impossible to do so. And sometimes you feel like you're just banging on the glass. You're on the outside looking in. And all of these are examples of what complexity is like. So before we go any further, I wanted to ask you to have a look at 
some of the things that you're doing at the moment. Can you take five minutes, please? In the chat box, could you just have a think and then identify what's complex about what you're working with at the moment in relation to your large-scale change or what you're hoping to do? Not the details, just which aspects of complexity re really resonate with you. So what's new? What's recalcitrant? Who's got a political element? Who needs to work across organizations? Who needs to engage partners? Um, who knows who's doing what? Who knows what their issue actually is or isn't? If you take five minutes, and then we'll have a look and see what people are saying. Thank you. So over to you. Okay. If you could send your comments to all participants on the chat, that would be perfect. Then we'll all be able to see them, including Debbie on the panel. Uh, I'll keep you company, Debbie, for a few minutes until Thank some you. chat comes in. It's begun. <laughs> it's started to come in already. <laughs> oh, it's yes. flying in. Yes. Lots of, lots of working across. Lots of many leaders. Definitely political uh, element. You, indeed. Yeah. Embedded systems, hard to change, I can see. Yep. New work, mm -hmm. integrated care yep. has got a mention already. Yep. No structure. Yep. Tick. No one person in charge, no governance. New agile culture, that's interesting. Mm. Mm. Many stakeholders and organisations. Uh, we yeah. will uh, we will look no at that in uh, in another session. Yeah, definitely. Not not clear on who the decision maker is. I think you were just chatting about that being quite typical, Debbie. Yes, yes. Don't know what to do. Involving lots of different organisations. Problem we've known about for decades and no one has cracked it. Scale of change too big. Again, agile state. What's national peace? Yeah. Trying to work across IT systems. Constantly moving goalposts. It's one of your favourites, that one, isn't it? Uh, unclear about which national body is leading, I just saw, eh? <laughs> many, no, I'm not many <laughs> no, neither am I. Many stakeholders, multiple dimensions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about stakeholders and how to think mm. about those uh, probably next week on mm. uh, the large scale change model session. Yeah. Well, I just saw someone starting a new position. Mm. Ruth, new position, new year, change facilitator. Yeah. In highly intelligent well, and qualified well. position, who are trained to challenge everything. <laughs> Absolutely. My way is the best way. You are, your job is to unite around my position. Complex varying priorities and willingness to share. Multiple systems, multiple priorities. Trust, Trust lack of it. Lack of it. <laughs> <laughs> We'll talk about that a lot. <laughs> I'm thinking it's the very same thought. Oh, that's a good, a good point. Mm. And there's real power and perceived power, and they're not necessarily the same thing. Here's an interesting one again, navigating a top-down management style. Mm. Sure, in relationship, we'll talk a lot about relationships as well. Good quality of that. High level visions, but no understanding of what was needed to achieve it. Mm. You've definitely started something here with this question, Demi. Mm. I mean, I think if we can hold all those for now. Um, don't, don't lose any of those because um, we will come back to all of them. I mean, what you're describing is exactly these kinds of complexities. They're working across organizations where people don't want to give up power or what they perceive as power, a political element of one kind or another, not clear who's in charge, questionable trust, 
questionable structures. These are all aspects of complexity. And the first thing to acknowledge, I think, is that this is difficult stuff. This is really hard. So give yourselves a break. When Ian and I were working on one of the Virtual Academy of Large Scale Change masterclasses earlier in the year, somebody described it as like being kicked in the head by a unicorn. You've got this wonderful, fantastic creature that you can see and you think in the distance, and it comes towards you, and you think it's going to be wonderful, and then it just kicks you in the head. So acknowledge that it is difficult. If things are difficult, quite often there is a tendency to, and a great temptation to want to avoid them in some way. Work avoidance, therefore, is something to watch for. If you, can, if you can avoid work avoidance and concentrate on complexity, you will be doing yourself a huge favor. Because the great thing is to say, enough already, we are not going to avoid complexity. We are actually going to face it head on. And one of the great things about systems leadership, I think, is that it gives you the tools and techniques and approaches to do that. And it does that, by the way, it's defined. Systems leadership is the collaborative leadership of a network of people. So, not a hierarchy. This is how you park hierarchy. You don't say it doesn't exist, but it gives you a way of parking it. Collaborative leadership of a network of people. They don't need to be in your organization. They don't need to be at your level. They don't need to have a similar job title to you. A network of people in different places and at different levels who come together on the basis of a common purpose. If you take nothing else away from this webinar, please, do take away the idea of common purpose. Common purpose is fundamental. It's not just saying, yes, we want to do something about, say, care of older people or care of children with disabilities. It's really understanding what it is that you want to do and why, and what it means for all the people in your network, what they have to bring, the strengths they have to offer, what they might have to give up, the pressures on them. It takes time and it is messy. It is absolutely worth taking that time and battling through that messiness because this is so fundamental. If you do not have common purpose, your large scale change will not get off the ground. I'm sorry, but it won't. So before you do anything else, work out what your common purpose is. If you have common purpose, you can fly. This is how you get people to give up organizational advantage for a wider goal, but get it there in the first place. And this is not about having a common purpose and standing still. This is about cooperating to make a significant change, a large-scale change. If you want to get to a common purpose, one way of doing that to form some different answers is to ask some different questions. And a nice question to start with is not how much money have we got here, even if we pool it. A nice question to ask is something much more open. What do we want life to be like for people in our place? So, it, who the people are doesn't matter. It can be your entire population. It can be people of working age. It can be children. It can be people with diabetes. It can be people, older people. It doesn't matter who the people are. The only thing that matters is that they matter to you. This is how you cut through. And it also enables you to ask, who else needs to be in the room here? Who isn't? Where are the patients? Where are the carers? Where are the families? Where are the topic experts? Where are the public health or the housing or the other people who need to be in the room? And some other things follow from this. This is about relationships. The relationships you have with each other and with other people that build trust over time and thereby enable you to exert influence. It's not saying that power relationships don't exist, but if you're trying to get large-scale change and you're trying to work in a system, 
this is always about the relationships that you have. So it's also thinking about who's in your network, who's in your coalition of the willing, a few people who think the way you do and where you can build up those relationships and keep working at them as well so that they keep going over time. There's a nice line, systems move at the speed of trust, and it's absolutely true. It's about also taking the scenic route when you need to. So go for partial and clumsy and emergent solutions rather than saying, here is our five-year plan and reality is going to follow this five-year plan no matter what. Much better to do lots and lots of short-term plans. Take a couple of steps, see where you are, and then decide what your next move should be. And it's also about what I call double-loop learning. Uh, rather than just whack-a-mole projects. You know, you do one project, and then you do another project, and then you do another project. Rather, take the learning and the principles from what you're doing and think how they apply more broadly. So don't start with organizations. Don't start with governance. Don't start with money. Start with common purpose and relationships and trust and emergent solutions and learning as you go. There's lots and lots of information and help about systems leadership and about how this works in practice. And at the end of these slides, uh, we've got the references for many of these. And I would say pilfer these relentlessly. And I thought what might be useful is, would be to distill some of the kind of key learning points from um, the, um, the reports and the thinking that's been done so far. The first thing I want to talk about is make the system work for you and act as if you're in a system rather than a series of organisations. Quite often when I talk to people and I ask them to describe their system, um, they'll describe their organisation and their organisational chart and it will be quite boxy and linear. You know, this is your name and this is your job title and this is you. A system, by contrast, is much more like this circle on the left. Um, this was the internet enrichment in 1992. Can you imagine how much more complex it is now? It looks scary and unreadable and chaotic, and it is all of those things. But don't be scared. Don't be daunted. See it as something that can work for you. You don't need to be able to read the entire system. Again, you won't be able to because it's too complex. The only bit of it, though, that you do need to be able to read is the bit that you want to change on the basis of your common purpose and with your coalition of the willing. And you can make the system work for you. If you're on the left-hand side of the circle and you want to get over to the right, you can think, who's in my network here? Who can help here? Who can send the messages for me? Who can help do some of the heavy lifting? In a network, in a system, you are never on your own and see yourself as having um, the ability to influence and change the system. The system is not just the sum of its parts. It's not just memoranda of understandings and strategies and policies. It's about the relationships between people, the information they give each other, the stories they tell each other on the basis of trust, which over time change the way the system sees itself and therefore what is possible. I sometimes say to people, be less Volvo. Volvo um, tried to test drive uh, driverless cars, and they started doing this in Scandinavia, where they came up against elk and caribou. They then moved to Australia, where they tried to test drive their driverless cars, but they came up instead against kangaroos. The driverless cars were only programmed to, to recognise elk and caribou, with the sad result that there are now fewer kangaroos in Australia than there were before Volvo started test driving their driverless cars, because Volvo saw their system as immutable and unchanging. Don't be like Volvo. See a system as something that can adapt and change, and that you can influence. There is a temptation um, when you see a system in this light to see a system as benign 
or at the very least neutral. And some things are benign. However, I have to tell you that not all things are benign, and some systems really are out to get you. If you're working in things that are difficult and complex, don't expect it to be plain sailing. You are going to get resistance. There are a couple of evolutionary biologists who've likened a system to a single-celled animal, like an amoeba. So this is Barry amoeba, um, shortly to be Barry and Larry amoeba. Uh, as you can see, Barry's not particularly bright, but he can feed, he can get around, he, as you can see, can reproduce, and, like any system, Barry is absolutely adapted to his environment. You come along, you say, I'd love to get some change in here for really good reasons, so better patient outcomes, lower costs, whatever it is. The natural response of the system is not to say, that's a fantastic idea, let's implement it straight away. The natural response of the system is to kill it, because it perceives it as a threat. Often a threat not necessarily of change, but of loss. And this can be perceived loss, it doesn't need to be real loss. It can be things like loss of job, but it's much more likely to be something like loss of identity, loss of culture, loss of professional status, loss of familiar ways of doing things. So it is worth thinking before you even attempt your large-scale change. Go out for a coffee with somebody, try and work out what the perceived losses might be. Otherwise, you will get all sorts of resistance thrown in your face, which don't feel quite real, but you can't quite work out why. And it's often because of this fear of loss. You do need to keep going. If the organism is held perturbed for sufficient time, it adapts to the new condition but it will take longer than you think and it will be harder than you think. So don't do this on your own. So the first thing is, is to know you're in a system and work with it and make that system work for you. Next, act according. Um, there are systems leadership behaviours that really work in these situations. Note, this is not the same thing as being the leader of the system. This is not about just leading from the front. I will sometimes describe this as leadership for introverts. This is about being thoughtful and reflective and calm and working in the background and supporting and enabling other people. And there is a very helpful summary of systems leadership behaviours. Um, the reference to this is given at the slide at the end of the webinar. And we identified sort of six dimensions of systems leadership behaviours. I just wanted to talk about a couple of them. Um, first of all, absolutely fine to base things on your values. If you've got values and common purpose together, they will see you through for the long haul whilst everything is changing around you. It's about standing back thinking what is actually going on here, observing, understanding, getting off the dance floor and onto the balcony and making time to think, what am I thinking about this? What are they thinking about this? What is actually going on here? And it's about intellectual rigour as well, making sense of things for other people, putting things together in new ways, as well as enabling and supporting other people and behaving in ways that lead to change, particularly around narrative and reframing. And we'll come on to talk about this in, in a minute. But this is what it pays to think about in terms of your own behaviours and also thinking about who in your teams is good at this. Who in your teams is good at this at any level. It doesn't matter what their role is. Really worth their thinking about this and really worth your thinking about how your teams operate, and who might be good to give a little experiment to, to see how they work in these situations. And adapting these behaviours and using these behaviours can mean, in practice, that you can get some very different outcomes. You start having different conversations, you start having honest conversations, and you can come out with some very, very different ways of working. So just as an example, in North Merseyside, their A&E delivery board 
um, came together on the basis of a common purpose, not around the four-hour target, but around how do we get more people in the right place at the right time to meet their needs. And this had really practical effects. They could actually agree what their better care fund money should be spent on. They could agree metrics. They could agree how to work together as a system. It didn't mean they didn't have problems, but the problems that they had weren't as great um, as they would have been if they had not been working as a system. So really, really think about these behaviours and practice them and see how you can make them work for you. So I wanted us just to have a little bit of time to reflect on this now, please. Um, on the next slide, um, we've actually set out some behaviours, um, prevalent behaviours, all sorts of different behaviours based on the dimensions that I've talked about before and what people do in these situations. Could you use the arrow pointer, please? Point at prevalent behaviours that you are seeing in your systems around your large scale change. And then in the chat box, and we'll take again about five minutes for this. If you could describe how they're helping, or possibly not, and what kinds of behaviours you'd like to encourage. So around values, around standing back a bit, around supporting and enabling other people, um, around using narrative and telling your story. So if I move on to the next slide, you see there um, the list of results setting out the prevalent behaviours that we would love you to have a look at. Have a look at these. Point and arrow um, at the ones that you're seeing, and then have a go in the chat box about describing briefly how they're helping or not, and the kinds of behaviours you'd like to encourage. So we'll take a couple of minutes for that. Thank you. Oh, oh it's people starting already. They're coming in, yeah. If you're, yes, um, if you're looking for the arrow pointer, if you move your mouse pointer to the left-hand side of the screen, there's kind of a translucent toolbar. If you click on the squiggly line at the top of that, then a new toolbar is going to appear at the left, and the arrow pointer is the top icon. I see most of you seem to have found it already, but if you're looking for it, that's where it is. Yes, and failing to acknowledge the work of others as well. So that's not enabling other people. Fails to listen, getting quite a bit. Embracing and utilising talent. This is partly about power, it's slow to adapt. And your comments are starting to come in as well. <laughs> <laughs> but some, some people are doing something, some are supporting distributed leadership as well, which again is supporting and, engage and um, enabling other people. So I'm saying failure to communicate and acknowledge the work of others is a common theme. Mm. Yes, indeed, the arrows seem to be suggesting that we're seeing at least a little bit of everything that you've anticipated here, mm. Devin. Mm. Yes, yes, there's nothing that, that's not, uh, that, that nobody's, nobody's said, oh no, this, isn't, this isn't us. And there, is, there are some people who can see um, where people in the system are supporting others, and people do have strong personal values. Yes, power struggle to be the leaders, yes. You've always done it this way. So just targets or achievements or KPIs, changing goalposts. Who can approve the release of communication? Well, I mean, waiting for the current initiative to pass by. Some of you yes. will remember the generation game and the conveyor belt. And it's like this conveyor belt of initiatives and people just watch it going past. Management organizers' hierarchies ingrained. And interesting, to regain control, you need to share. That's a really profound insight. Indeed. This, this idea of uh, the prevailing style of management being a great barrier to change is very interesting. Mm. This need to move from it being organized as a hierarchy to a system. Yes. Yeah. Only working, trying to create a system working with only working with particular silos. It will go full circle, so keep doing it my way. 
I'll just hide until, until I don't need the change caravan goes fast. What change as long as it won't impact them? So, yes, we'd love change, but as long as it's somebody else. So wanting people to step back and understand the problem together. Absolutely, some, but one of the best things you can do is come together and truly think about what the issues are and what they mean to a different people. Risk averse behaviours. Mm. Oh, yes. I would encourage people, this is a shameless plug, but I would encourage people to come to the um, two-day uh, Virtual Academy of Large-Scale Change Masterclasses um, or anything else put on by Sustainable Improvement because um, in those um, forums we concentrate on all of the things that you are describing and how you can work with them in very practical ways and in real time. Um, yes, expressions of interest to join our one remaining open masterclass in Leeds uh, it, that is open now until I think the 19th or 20th of November. <laughs> it's likely to be oversubscribed as they usually are. Uh, yes. Please do, please do um, put in your expressions of interest if you'd like to come along and join uh, ourselves with uh, Debbie and some other of our faculty members. Paralysis by analysis, rather than having a go. Yes, yes. Mm. Now, how are we doing for time, Debbie? I think um, I think we we could stay a long time on this, uh, but I think I will move on um, just okay. so that I can cover the the other um, areas that I want to to flag up. Um, Keep but the comments again, coming, hold those thoughts because this is partly about raising awareness of what is happening in your system. One other thing that you can do here, a really powerful tool in your armory, is public narrative, to tell your story. Um, people sometimes say, oh, I don't want to talk about myself, that would be the worst thing. Um, this isn't just about tell me about yourself, um, nor is it just anecdote, you know, I met this bloke down the pub. Um, this is about an emotional resonance story grounded in what brought you to this place on this point, why this matters for other people, and why this compels to action now. So it connects with values and emotions, and it does so on the basis of evidence. And what it can look like in practice is this. Um, the UK government, a couple of years ago, proposed reducing tax credit thresholds, and it asked the Institute for Fiscal Studies to answer the question, would the introduction of the national living wage compensate for this? Uh, short answer, no. Um, longer answer in um, a report for MPs, a very, very sober mathematical language. So this is an excerpt from it. It talked about scenarios and deciles and household income distribution. Now, there is the evidence. Fast forward to Baroness Hollis in the House of Lords a couple of months later. Did she talk about deciles and household income distribution? No, she did not. She told a story, reading out letters from people who would be affected. And then she ran the point home with a bolt gun. Think of the poor people getting Christmas letters from the Chancellor, she repeated frequently, her voice getting softer by the second. The Christmas letters. You do not need to go the full tiny tin on this. This is an extreme example but it shows you the power of narrative, the power of story. If you want to influence people and get them from ideas to action, this is how. And it is absolutely worth thinking about your narrative and practicing it and practicing it amongst your teams as well. So think about what's your story, what's the story you want to tell. Um, somebody earlier talked about paralysis by analysis. Um, the thing to do here is actually just make a start, do something. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, there's a writer called Myron Rogers who writes frequently um, on systems leadership, and he has these maxims that I think everybody should paste to the wall. And one of them is, start anywhere, but follow it everywhere. This only makes sense in practice. 
It's not a theoretical construct. So real change takes place in real work, and the people who do the work are the ones who do the change. And people own what they create. So let people on the front line actually have a go on a small scale of doing something different. But the key thing is not to wait around until everything is perfect. Just make a start and see where you get. And you're not um, starting from scratch. There's an awful lot of learning here. There will always be good and reasonable reasons not to do things. So culture, history, geography, politics. Sometimes it is the wrong time, and the wrong place, and the wrong people. Helen Bevan has a nice uh, line, I think it's a Native American line, if your horse is dead, get off it. Sometimes it is just the wrong time and you've got to choose your battles, and you may not be able to go in in the place where you want to. But that's not a reason not to do something. The key thing is to hold fast to common purpose and see where, with your coalition of the willing, you can get some action. And there are things that you can do. So, get real. Identify an issue where you can do real work. Work with your coalition around a common purpose. Have those com conversations that are honest and raise the differences, raise the, the concerns, raise the problems. Don't try and, and magic them away. Whatever gets in the way of the work is the work. Use small-scale experiments and prototypes rather than pilots. So you have a prototype. Some of it will work. Some of it will, will work. Use what works. Amplify what works. Uh, discard what doesn't work or tweak it and improve it and thereby continue on continuous improvement. And use narratives and framing and frames to change perspectives. And for the last part of this, this webinar, I wanted to talk about framing. Many of you will recognize this person. This is the late, great Leonard Rossiter as Reginald Perrin. In this photo, Reggie has just thought of his mother-in-law. If the image of a hippo has come into your mind, that's because the hippo is the frame that Reggie is using about his mother-in-law. The hippo is a frame. A frame is like culture in shorthand. It's a set of ideas and concepts that allow us to accord meaning to events and information. So, it's how different parts of the NHS see each other, how primary care sees secondary care and vice versa how the NHS sees local government, how local government sees the NHS. These are the images we hold with us at subconscious and subliminal levels. They're often based in metaphor. I know one A&E consultant who sees our allied health professionals as small woodland creatures. They're often about emotions and they're often deeply held, even if they're unspoken. And because of that, they are very, very powerful. I sometimes describe them as prisms and prisms. Prisms because everything you see gets slanted through the, the frame that you're using, and prisms because they stop you actually seeing what's actually happening or what you're being told. But the great thing is that they are not immutable. And once a frame has become established and changed and become accepted, it becomes common sense. And people can turn on a dime. So reframing gives you a way to get your point across in a way that changes thinking. It's fundamental to good systems leadership. And in case you say, oh, but I'm a rational person, you know, I'm an intelligent person, this doesn't apply to me. Oh, yes, it does. You bet it does. It absolutely applies to you. In the words of the late, great Malcolm Allison, retaliate first. Make sure your frame, the story you want to get out there, gets established. This is not incidentally about saying um, this is about competing fictions, it absolutely isn't, but it is about thinking about the story, the frame you want to get out there. Because once the story, once the frame is out there, it's very hard to change. You can't negate a frame. If you just say no it isn't, all you'll do is reinforce it in people's minds. 
So start from where people are and think about who you're going to work with to get your message across because the messenger often is the message. I can be in a meeting and say something and I'll watch it going over people's heads. Somebody else can say exactly the same thing and it's suddenly, oh, you're a genius. That's fantastic. It's really annoying, but it happens. So who's your effective messenger here? Is it doctor, doctor to doctor? Is it nurse, nurse to nurse? Is it a patient, a patient group, a set of citizens, a counsellor? It might not be you, which is a frustrating thing, but is reality. So it is worth thinking about who your messenger is and working with your coalition of the willing and your network to think about who can best deliver the message for you. So, in our last bit of interactivity here, I wanted us to take, uh, so take um, just over about seven minutes, I think. Um, in the chat box, could you please write out either the worst media headline you can think of in relation to your large-scale change, or for those of you on social media, the worst tweet you can imagine. You know, something hashtag murder is usually a good one. And then yeah. I, how you might reframe either the headline or the tweet to change the story. So have a think about this first of all, and then think of very briefly, maximum 10 words, worst headline or worst tweet, and how you might change it to tell the story that you want to tell. These can be real or imagined. Over to you. Now, uh, we do run this activity, Debbie, with groups live in uh, some of our masterclass sessions, and it can throw up some very interesting, uh, yes. interesting mm -hmm. frames, shall we say. Mm. Yes. Uh, people are either thinking about real, this one. Are there real headlines that people have used or have seen? Bosch has come in, I think, uh, oh, yes. taking a little bit of inspiration <laughs> yes. from your vote yes. leave example there. Yes. Absolutely. Hospices, killing people. You were dying to get into a hospice. <laughs> and we're off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> STP is being able to privatise the NHS. Our NHS being sold off to private providers. That's actually quite common. That just need to change to keep the NHS moving. Oh. <laughs> well, a lot of very harsh headlines here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> just to remind. Increase more hospital beds available. <laughs> well, that's one frame. That's a definite. That's definitely one that's going in the box. Uh, I hope that was a frame and not somebody spamming yeah. us there. Yeah. Only in disadvantage after travel third for cataract surgery. Save our NHS AD under review. I'm sure many people have had that. Oh, yeah. Person, I like the person injured in lift incident at hospital. Person treated mm. at hospital mm. after incident in lift. <laughs> NHS only saved by review. Billions wasted on new paediatric hospital. So have a think about what, what you would want the story to be as well. What's the frame that you would want to get out there? Not just saying no, it isn't. Not um, not spinning. Not um, not lying. Uh, but just thinking about what's the frame we would want to use. Mm -hmm. Doesn't cost that way. I'm staffed with big services. So if you have bureaucratic management, that would be even better. Best way to go, hospice care. Something like that. Mm. It is in hallways, it's in a wall, and now we have to build a door. Mm. 
decent IT. Support from bottom up to improve maternity services for mums and babies. Very nice. Thank you, Mohammed. What well, terms of staff deliver a seven day NHS that needs staffing review to like improve that. service? Yes, that's a nice one. That's really nice. Local leaders go the extra mile to improve patient care. Oh, NHS England supporting and encouraging BCSE organisations to deliver health and care. I think that's uh, building on Felicity's earlier. Uh, yeah. Terrible, terrible imagined <laughs> yeah. Patients happy to travel for excellent services. Mm -hmm. It just manages patients' record to plan and deliver the best individual health care. See, th these are not um, just saying, no, this isn't happening. They're actually, it actually makes you think about the frames that you want to get out there, how you see other people in your system and in your large scale change, how they see you and how to, to work with the frames that you've got and be aware of them and then think about how you might want to change them. Oh, homes not ho hashtag homes not hospital. NHS England working to give great care closer to home. Great partnership of providers brought together to give great care closer to home. Hashtag learning disability. I hope this gives you an idea of how frames and how framing can help you. This is an absolute whistle stop introduction to framing. But I'd really um, encourage you to think about narrative and framing as part of your systems leadership approaches to large-scale change. So just to kind of draw this to a close with any kind of final questions that people have, because if there are lessons from this, I think fundamentally it's hang on in there. Know where you're starting from. It is going to be complex, so you are likely to get resistance from this. Think of what you're doing even though it's called large-scale change, in terms of lots of small changes, just as much, if not more than, in terms of big bang and sudden massive changes. So know what you're dealing with. Make the system work for you. Think about how a system might respond. It might not welcome what you're doing in open arms. It might resist um, because it fears loss as much as change. This is about what do we want to do, what's our purpose here, what are we really here to do, what do we all understand each other as needing to do in order to get there. It's absolutely about relationships and trust and influence and using the networks you have and thinking who can do the heavy lifting for you and taking the scenic route, lots and lots of short-term planning rather than one big plan. Get your coalition of the willing together. Do something real. Work with systems leadership behaviours, particularly around narrative and framing. And keep going. You know, if you take the scenic route, if you allow for setbacks, if you look for progress rather than instant solutions, it really is possible to see large-scale change taking hold and taking shape. And on that note, and I say thank you for being part of this webinar. I just want to show you this as part of the slides. I don't want to go through this now, but this is a practical framing and reframing exercise for you and your teams. And it's quite simple, but it's very, very effective and revealing in the frames that it actually shows up and giving you a space and a way to think differently about the frames that, that you use and the perceptions that people have. So it's worth, worth using. Um, these are the links to all the information about the references and the publications I mentioned earlier. It's absolutely worth having a look at that. 
And I think I'm going to hand back to Ian now to take us through sort of any final questions or thoughts or comments that people might have. So Ian, well, I'll take that to you. We, we might have time for one or two questions for, um, for Debbie before we close out. We've got a couple of little bits of information to share with you before we close on the half hour. So uh, here we go. Sarah's gone. Where do we get access to the presentation today for the, uh, the hyperlinks? Well, I will answer that one in a moment, but we'll maybe take Johnny's question first for you, Debbie. You mentioned earlier about prototype rather than pilot. What's yeah. the difference? The way, Johnny, um, I think I'll pick up Sarah's question. Pilotitis. Um, the way pilots are commonly used or understood is you will have a project and you will call it a pilot or a program that will cover a particular area. And um, much fanfare will be made of this pilot. It will either work or it won't work. If it works, the common response is, ooh, let us replicate this at pace and at scale. This is not possible because the circumstances that allowed for the success in a particular area are not usually replicable elsewhere. The circumstances are different, the people are different, the setup is different, it will not be a lift and shift. Um, but pilots are seen in this way. Oh, by the way, if a pilot doesn't work, it's then absolutely forgotten and all the learning just goes. A prototype by contrast, is where you have a project or a program in an area and you look at what happens and then instead of saying it's working or it's not working, you think if it's working, what do we learn about the underlying principles that can be used and adapted elsewhere rather than lifted and shifted? And if it's not working, what are the bits that aren't working and do we understand why and how can we work on them and adapt them so that they work a bit better. So a prototype is, uh, is congruent with the idea of progress at the margins which underpins systems leadership. Um, a pilot, by contrast, is much more kind of lift and shift. And if you're trying to get large scale change, you're much better off trying to do something as a prototype than as a pilot. Okay, thank you very much, Debbie. So, uh, last couple of minutes. Uh, well, first of all, can I just say thank you to Debbie for being online with us today. Um, obviously, we've joined each other on this WebEx uh, several times, and obviously we've done masterclasses together. I'm still learning new things and looking at things in slightly different ways every time we do it. So, thank you for me. I hope others have got from it as much as I have again today. Uh, to answer the question a little bit earlier, where can we get access to the materials and the slide decks that Debbie has used today, including that uh, exercise you can do with Teams? Um, my colleague Claire's just popped some information in the chat box. You can get everything from the Virtual Academy on our collaboration space, which is on NHS Networks, the link there uh, on the screen. I think there's some links in the chat box as well. We'll have sent to everyone who's registered or has been part of our induction instructions on how to join the space if you're Having problems finding that, get in touch with one of the team through the Virtual Academy inbox that has sent you information about your registrations and your links to, to today. Um, also on there, you'll find information about CPD, Continuing Professional Development Points, if you, uh, if you require them. Uh, if you're joining us live today, you can uh, do the learning questionnaire, which will pop up after the WebEx ends in a minute or so's time. If you're watching this on a recording, which you can also access through the collaboration space, if you want to watch offline, if you want to rewatch, or if you missed a session, there's also links in there to an offline survey to do the learning questions if you want or require any CPD points. Uh, so final thing before we let you go, I think we're just about to hit the half hour, is what's coming next. Uh, next session, building on uh, these concepts of system leadership that Debbie has shared with us today, we'll be looking at our leading large-scale change model with uh, our guest faculty, Alison Wheeler, uh, who one of our teams worked with Ali today up in, uh, in Cheshire, where at the same time, same place, 12.30, and it'll be Thursday, the 15th of November. You can register via the links that have just popped up in the chat box. Hopefully, we'll see you all next week at 12.30 on Thursday. Until then, We'll leave you to have a good day. Many thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Many thanks, folks.